Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm one of the designers of 13 Days, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The game is a medium complexity two-player game that plays in 45 minutes. I'm here to teach you how to play the game, but first let me introduce the setting. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The Cuban Missile Crisis is probably the single point in time where humanity came closest to a global nuclear war. The conflict lasted 13 days in October 1962. During these 10 days, President Kennedy and Khrushchev went back and forth in a high-stakes game of superpower showdown. Both superpowers pushed their agendas as far as they could while not pushing so hard as to trigger a global nuclear war. This balancing act of conflicting forces is exactly the experience we want to give you in 13 days. Before proceeding to the rules, you need to know the components. Inside the box of 13 days, you will find one game board laid out in the middle of the table. US player sits at the western end, USSR at the eastern end. There are 39 strategy cards. Shuffle the deck and place them here. The 13 hidden agendas are also shuffled and placed next to the strategy cards. There is one personal letter. The US player starts with the letter, so place it face up on his side of the table. Each player starts the game with 17 influence cubes. Give the blue cubes to the US, the red to the USSR. Two of each color cube starts on the board, as indicated here. And here. Each player is also handed three flag counters that will come in use later. Then you place the six DEFCON markers on the DEFCON track where indicated. Blue belongs to the US and red to the USSR. Finally, the prestige marker goes on the prestige track and the round marker on the round track. And those were all the components for 13 days set up for play. Now let's dive into the rules. One player takes the role of President Kennedy, the other President Khrushchev. The winner is the player that emerges from a crisis with the most prestige. There are two basic ways in which prestige can be earned. The first is by dominating nine different battlegrounds across the global arena, such as Berlin or Cuba. The second is to dominate the three different DEF contracts. Military, political and world opinion. Yet, to win a game of 13 days, you must first avoid losing it. You lose immediately if any of your DEFCON markers finishes a round in the DEFCON 1 area. Or if all three of your DEFCON markers finish a round in the DEFCON 2 area. If either of these happens, you have pushed the confrontation so far that it triggers a global nuclear war. History will remember you as the aggressor and you lose the game immediately, regardless of the score. Now, let's take a closer look at how the game is structured. The game is divided into three rounds total. Each round is then divided into seven phases. In the first phase, all DEFCON markers are simply escalated one step. In the second phase, the agenda cards are shuffled. Then, each player draws three cards. Mark the agendas you drew by placing your flag counters on corresponding battlegrounds or DEF contracts. Finally, you secretly pick a single agenda to score at the end of the round. Tuck it beneath the ball. The leftover agenda cards are returned to the deck, still face down. Meanwhile, your opponent does the same. This scoring method ensures that the following round becomes part of a bluffing game, where some, but not all, information is available. The third phase contains the bread and butter of the gameplay. Each player draws five strategy cards and looks at them. 
Then the player who is trailing on prestige decides who has the initiative and therefore must play the first card. Usually playing last is a wise choice, but there are exceptions. If players are tied on prestige, the USSR decides initiative. This is always the case in the first round. Once initiative has been decided, it is time to play your first strategy card. Pick one from your hand and place it in front of you, face up. Each card can be played in one of two different ways, either for command or as an event. If you played this card for command, pick a single battleground on the board and either place or remove as many of your own influence as shown on the card. This card allows up to three cubes, though you're always allowed to spend fewer cubes than indicated. It's important to remember that you can never have more than five of your own influence cubes on a single battleground. Remember that one of the key ways to end prestige is by dominating battlegrounds. This makes the command action very useful. However, each battleground is also linked to a specific death contract as indicated by both the color and the icon. Italy is a green battleground connected to the political death contract. When you play a command action and decide to place influence, the death contract escalates. If you remove influence, the track deflates. The actual steps moved up or down the death contract is one less than the total cubes used for the command action. If one cube is placed, nothing happens. If two cubes are placed, the track escalates one step. Three cubes escalates two steps. The same formula applies to removing cubes, except the death contract deflates. Being ahead on the death contract is the other main way to end prestige. However, it also holds the risk of losing you the game. But remember that a card can also be played as an event. All 39 strategy cards in the game come with their own unique event, and each event may allow you to break some of the rules I just explained for command. This specific event here allows you to place one influence cube in three different battlegrounds. The same card played for command can only ever influence a single battleground. The variety of events are too large to cover in this video. You'll have to play the game yourself to discover all of them. You will also notice the DEFCON icon on the side of the card. It tells you if the event affects the DEFCON track or not. In this case it doesn't, but when cards do, they follow the same formula as explained for command. Strategy cards also have one of three alignments. There are 13 US, 13 USSR and 13 neutral UN cards. When you play a card with your own alignment, or one of the UN cards you may decide to play it for the command or the event, as just explained. Your opponent's cards, however, may only be played for command. You simply cannot choose to activate the event. More importantly, before executing your command action, you must hand the card to your opponent, who then decides if he wants to activate the event. Once he has decided and possibly played the event, you receive the card back and may then play your command action as normal. Now is a good time to introduce the personal letter that was given to the US player during setup. With this UN card, you could place or remove up to four influence cubes if boosted by the personal letter. After playing the personal letter, hand the card over to your opponent. Now he may use it from his next turn onwards. Players take turns playing one strategy card at a time until they have both played four cards and hold one leftover card in their hand. This is where the fourth phase begins. The leftover card represents the resources you have dedicated to building up alliances. Tuck it beneath the game board here, but don't show it to your opponent. At the end of the game, all cards from the stack are tallied up, and whoever has the most influence of their own alignment gains two prestige. The fifth phase allows you to manipulate the game state right before scoring. This can be done if you dominate one of the three world opinion battlegrounds. Each battleground has a unique ability. The UN battleground allows you to claim the personal letter from your opponent. The television battleground allows you to escalate or deflate one of your own death contracts. And the alliances battleground allows you to draw the top card from the strategy deck and then decide to add it to the aftermath stack, or simply discard it face up. After having used the world opinion to manipulate the game board, the sixth phase begins. The agenda cards are revealed, and this is where your cunning plan comes to fruition. Both players flip their agenda cards and show what is to be scored for the round. 
In this case, it's the Italian battleground and the military death contract. For a battleground, score the difference in influence cubes to the player who has the most influence there. Then add any modifiers. For DEF contracts, you first escalate all DEF CON markers in the specific DEF CON 2 area a single step. Then score the difference in steps, adding a modifier of 1. The prestige is awarded to the player that is most escalated. All scoring cards are resolved simultaneously, and the maximum possible score at the end of the phase is 5 prestige to either side. More than that is wasted. Before proceeding to the next phase, you check to see if any players triggered global nuclear war and ended their game. In the seventh and final phase, you advance the round marker and proceed to the next round. If this was the third round, you tally up the aftermath pile and award the two prestige. After doing that, the winner is the player who has the most prestige. In case of a tie, the player holding the personal letter is the winner. And that's how to play 13 days. Thank you for watching and enjoy the game.